right? We have gone through some weather this week, and uh, it, it kind of reminds me just how awesome God is, um, especially that meteor. Did you all hear or see about that? That was incredible. Um, you know, sometimes we need a big, amazing thing to remind us of how awesome God is and how surprising God is. But sometimes we appreciate the daily, ordinary, everyday things that, that we encounter. And um, we count those as blessings. And so in this month of November, the month of Thanksgiving, it's important to kind of number our blessings, to keep track of them. Uh, and you are certainly in my heart as uh, big blessings. I'm glad to welcome you here this morning. As you picked up your bulletin, um, you might have noticed that there's some extra things in there. Uh, one of them is a giving thanks brochure, and this helps you to think about ways that you can give to your church. Last week, we gave the pledge cards out, and we'll be collecting those on the first Sunday of December and dedicating them. It's a time for you to think about what you give to the church in the next year, to be intentional about that giving. You know, everything that we have comes from God, and so we uh, give thanks to God for those blessings. And if we just kind of rocket through life and we give what we feel or we've got some extra money in our wallet and we give that, you know, that's one thing. And that's, that's operating out of an impulse of, of feeling. But if we are intentional about our giving and make a plan for it with our families, with our spouse, uh, if we pray about it, talk to God about it, then that helps us to grow as a spiritual discipline, to help us grow in our faith, to be intentional. Friends, today we are on the third part of a sermon series following these three simple rules. And so the, the first one, week one, was, help me out if you remember, do no harm, right? The second one, what we talked about last week, was to do good, do good. And then this week, we're going to talk about how we stay in love with God. Now, you might have heard that phrase differently in other places, but we're going to talk about how we stay in love with God. It might help us with our relationships with people as well. The other insert that you got was a Thanksgiving one, and I'm going to invite Connie Anderson to come up and talk about our big Thanksgiving dinner. If you've ever wanted to be part of a small group, Thanksgiving Day is the day to do it. We have a group called the Seekers. They spend a lot of hours plotting out maps, pinpointing all the places that the next group called the Finders <laughs> will go to. <laughs> this group needs lots of members. You come, you get a map from the Seekers, the finders look at it. Now, there are two qualifications. First of all, you have to have a valid driver's license. Secondly, you have to be able to read those maps. <laughs> I have a group called the Sweet Spirits. They slice the pie and they package the pie. Two qualifications for that. You have to be able to handle a knife safely. That's the key word. <laughs> You also have to be able to take a magic marker and write the letter P on top of the package. <laughs> okay? If you're qualified for that, we'd love to have you. <laughs> Another group called the Bread of Life. They individually wrap homemade rolls for all 1,600 plus people we're going to be serving. That is probably the cleanest job we have. <laughs> But they also have the messiest job. They have to open over 250 cans of cranberry sauce and slice it. Now you think, what's the big deal? Well, have you ever sliced cranberry sauce? It's pretty difficult. We have a custom-made cranberry slicer, so you'll have to be trained on that, but we can do that. A group called the Preparers of the Way have to take a lot of heat. Guess where I'm going with this one. <laughs> That's my stu stove gurus, as I have called them. They make the stuffing, they cook the potatoes, they cook the sweet potatoes, 
They make the gravy and the green beans. Now, they also have to take a lot of heat from the people out in the other room yelling, we need more green beans. We need more gravy. They can handle it. They can do it. Now, when they get done, all of the food goes out to the servers of the Lord. They stand in lines and dish up food. Now, if you want to be part of that group, you have to be able to take a spoon and go like this. Okay? Now, as the plates are filled, they are closed by Aaron and Moses. <laughs> Aaron is over here. <laughs> they work with the pillars of our church. You see, the pillars of our church build st tall stacks of corrugated boxes that they stack all of these meals into. Those boxes are then given to the deliverers of the way on little carts, and they take all of this food out. Now, some of you are probably sitting there going, wait a minute, I've been part of another group, and you haven't even mentioned them. I call them the cane raisers. <laughs> Those are the people who peel the potatoes. <laughs> they know who they are. <laughs> they're very loud, but they're a lot of fun. I provide peelers, the actual peeler itself, but they don't like my peelers. They bring their own. <laughs> That's true. That's right. They have taken potato peeling to a whole new level. <laughs> Before I go, I do want to say thank you to all of you who have already signed up to help that day. I want to put out a special thank you to one of our members who has donated 80 pounds of homegrown sweet potatoes for our event. And also to the St. Charles JCs and the Junior JCs who have made a huge monetary donation to help buy the turkeys, the extra turkeys I need. And I was just given another envelope with more money from them, from individuals of the group, and they're donating some of their time. So thank you all. We appreciate everything you do. Thank you. So Connie's talking about the Thanksgiving dinner. It grew from uh, feeding Meals on Wheels folks, about 35 people many years ago, to over 1,600 people. So I think you can tell that we need everybody. Um, and bring your friends and family from outside the church, too. This is a great way to be in service on Thanksgiving morning. And then uh, they serve a dinner for people that work, but you could also have dinner with your family. So it's a way to really uh, know that you're making a difference in people's lives. And it is something to behold. Friends, many of us have done it for several years, but if you haven't, please come and just get involved. Connie will find a place for you on one of those teams. And you can fill this out, drop it in the offering baskets on your way today. And I, Connie's delivering things. Okay, right. I thought you might have another one. Right. And so if you have any questions, of course, just ask Connie. Uh, but we are so glad that, that uh, we can have an impact in our community. Let's go to God in prayer. Gracious and loving God, every day you wake us up with new blessings and we give you thanks. Help us to realize that you are always working for good in the world and inviting us to be part of that. So God, whether it's for good in our families or doing good to people that we may never meet, we thank you for that opportunity. Bless our worship today. Let our songs be songs of praise. Open our ears to hear the message that you have for us. And we give you thanks and praise in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs>
please join in the unison prayer. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hidden. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Remain standing for the opening song. Love the Lord in the Green Hymnal, page 3119, where you can sing along with the words on the screen.
do his thing. Okay. <laughs> Are you going to give it to mom? Okay. All right, he'll be back. So, boys and girls, what I wanted to talk with you about today is love. And I brought a little heart for you. There you go. Now, let's see. This is um, Alexis. Okay, Alexis. There you go. And Adeline, is that right? Did I say right? Okay. And Sam, here's one for you. I didn't forget Ezra. He's waiting. There you go. Good, 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 good. So, yeah. All right. So, show everybody out there what you got. Can you hold it up high so they can all see? Yeah. So, I gave everybody a heart. It's a squishy heart. Um, it's fun to play with. But hearts are also a symbol of what? Love. Love. That's right. Friends, if you don't have a squishy heart out there to play with, I'm going to invite you to make a heart with your hands. Can you do that? See, everybody can do this. There's another heart shape. What I want to talk to the adults about today is how we stay in love with God. And I thought, yeah, that's where you can do it too. Yeah, that's right. And I thought this would help us uh, to remind us to show love to everyone. So... You can play with this heart, you can give it to a friend or a family member, or you can just um, use it to remind you to show love. So let's talk about that. What are ways that we show love? Are you thinking? Ezra, how do you show love? Do you give hugs? You do, don't you? Yeah, yeah. Logan, how do you show love? You give kisses, okay. Girls, how do you show love? Do you, you share with your sister? You know, sharing is a way of showing love. They're having fun with their hearts. <laughs> Sam, how do you show love? You see, every time I see Sam, he's smiling, and that's a great way to share love. Um, adults, get in on this. How, how do you show love? Call, call, call something out. Oh my goodness, I thought you would have lots of ideas. <laughs> Helping someone else. Great. Doing something you don't want to do? For somebody else. Yes, okay, I like that answer. Do no harm. Do no harm, very good. How many of you have had to uh, press the pause button this week because you didn't want to say or do anything harmful? We're still practicing that. Yes, I see some hands going up. How about on this side of the room? What are ways that you show love? Cookie? That is a wonderful way to show love. Reaching out to friends and family. That could be a phone call or uh, making a visit or a, even a text. Um, that reminds me, I got a very special message of love this morning. It's probably going to surprise my mother. I got a picture from my son, and it was of his girlfriend wearing an engagement ring. So that just happened this morning. Sorry. Actually, it happened last night, but he didn't send me the picture until this morning. So, yeah. I know that you know lots of ways to share love. I, this was just to kind of spark us up to get us thinking about it. Uh, boys and girls, can we have our prayer now? Do you want All right, hold on to your heart. We're going to do our prayer hands, and the heart can be in the middle. And will you help us pray? Like this? Yeah, you can do that. Okay, girls, you ready? <coughs> Sam? All right. Yeah, hold your heart, close your eyes, and, and uh, let's pray. Dear God, Thanks for loving us. Thanks for loving us. Thanks for all the ways that we experience your love. Thanks for all the ways we experience your love. And help us to show your love to everyone we meet. We pray in Jesus' name.
Alexis and Adeline's first time up here with us, but they attend our preschool. And one of the things I do at the preschool is, is talk to the kiddos in here so they have an experience of, of what it's like to come to church. Well, here comes Joel and Anna. More friends to show love to. We are just uh, finishing our time together, but I gave everybody a heart. Would you like one? While they're going on out, I invite you to stand and share one way that you are thankful. Share that with a friend that's close to you.
join me in a prayer of illumination. Prepare our hearts, O oh Lord, to accept your word. Let us hear and obey your will. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. I'll be reading from Colossians chapter 2, verses 6 through 7. As you therefore have received Christ Jesus the Lord, continue to live your lives in him, rooted and built up in him, and established in the faith, just as you were taught, abounding in thanksgiving. This is the word of life. Thanks be to God. Please be seated. So friends, as I said, this is our, the third part of our worship series about these three simple rules that will change your life. Uh, the do no harm, do good, stay in love with God. And John Wesley, who was the founder of the Methodist movement, he feared that people would fail to live faithful lives. I think he knew, uh, you know, people get all excited, they, they, they want to uh, dedicate their life to Christ, and then after a while, uh, if they don't keep practicing, keep doing some things, Oh, it just is one more good idea that kind of goes by the wayside. So he was determined to foster some practices. Uh, I think I've told you that uh, Methodists, these methods, the very, John Wesley was very methodical, those were all derogatory terms. We say that we're United Methodists now, yeah, pretty proudly. Um, but at the time, people made fun of him for being so methodical. But friends, it helped. It helped him to to develop these practices and then he taught them to other people and because he knew that they would lead to faithfulness in, in following Jesus. So these practices that we're talking about, they're called the general rules and they're in our United Methodist um, Book of Discipline and they can transform lives when they're combined with the accountability of being part of a small group of people who are also striving to grow in their faith in Jesus. So you, you might be part of a small group that um, meets in someone's home, or you might be part of a Sunday school class, or another kind of group that, that gets together. And these are a group of close friends that are not afraid to say, hey, how is it with your soul? That's a deeper question than how you doing today. Um, so you need that, that small group of trusted friends that you can have these deep conversations with. Um, because when I think about staying in love with God, the first thing that comes to mind is just what a big, puffy, nebulous word that, that word love is. I mean, it's hard to really uh, get a hold of. And friends, you, I didn't realize this, but um, you illustrated that beautifully when I said, how do you show love? And we know we know this, but it took us a while to think about, oh, what do I actually do that shows love? Well, in the Bible, God says, God is love. And that, so it's really important. And, and, and love is a great, awesome idea. But, but how do we get a hold of it? How do we help it to grow? Jesus said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind, and all your strength. And love your neighbor as you love yourself. And we even sang about that this morning in that first song. So how can I take that giant, puffy idea of love and turn it into something that I can understand in my everyday life? Well, I thought we'd start by examining ways that we know that we are in love with another person. So author Kathleen Moore offered these ideas to know or to measure if you're in love with someone. So think about these as, as I read them and see how they resonate with you. Uh, you want to be near them physically. You want to know everything about them. Number three, you rejoice in the fact of their existence. I'm, you might say, I'm so glad you're you. Number four, you fear their loss. You, you grieve their injuries. If your loved one gets hurt, you feel it. Number five, you want to protect them. Number six, you are transformed in their presence. Be, put it another way, being around them makes you better, makes, you, makes your life more full. Number seven, you want to be joined with them, lost in them. 
And number eight, you want the best for them, desperately. Think about those that you love and how do these, these markers, how do they resonate with that? Well, you know, while you're thinking about that, I'm just going to say, in the Bible, there's that whole 1 Corinthians chapter 13 gig. And um, we hear this a lot. In fact, you know it. When, and I have couples that come to me and they want to get married and, they, and we're planning their service and they say, you can read anything, but don't read that. We've heard it a million times. So, friends, I'm going to tell you, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, the, the love chapter, could be the sermon topic every week. And when we start living this way, then we can stop talking about it. it. But it helps us to put in practice with this giant idea of what is love. So, if you have a relationship with someone else and you use the word love to describe that relationship, think about these characteristics. First, from 1 first Corinthians chapter 13. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love does not boast. Love is not rude. Love is not self-seeking. Does that mean any relationship where I catch myself uh, being self-seeking or selfish? Um, uh, uh, maybe it's not completely about love? Well, we are imperfect people. This is something to work on. Love keeps no record of wrongs. Love always protects, always trusts, always hopes, and always perseveres. There are other places in the Bible, um, and if you want to make a note, if you make a note in your in your sermon notes and things to read later this week, so you'll you'll want to look up um, certainly the scripture that Karen read today from the book of Colossians chapter two. You'll want to look up and read for yourself First Corinthians chapter thirteen, but you might also look at Revelation chapter two. Because in it, the apostle is writing to churches that have kind of lost their first love for Jesus. And he's writing um, uh, not too long after Jesus was crucified. And so it really didn't take too many years for some of these churches to kind of lose their first love. But you know what? Love is actually kind of easy to lose. Um, and I'm talking about more than a feeling. Love is more than a feeling. Because feelings come and go. When we lose a love, it's marked by how our priorities change. You spend less time together. Unfortunately, that person becomes less relevant to us. If you have relationships in your life, friendships, relationships, that used to be relationships of love, but now they're not, just see, are you, are you spending less time together? Is the person less relevant to you? They don't matter as much. Well, how do you know if you're losing it? How, how do you know if you're losing love? Here's an easy way to tell. Is there anybody here that has never been on an elevator? All right, I'm seeing hands going up. So you know when you get on an elevator, there are rules. There are rules of decorum that govern our behavior. So you get in the elevator, and you, you face forward, the door's shut, you just mind your own business, you don't talk to anybody, you know what I'm saying. You're thinking to yourself, I'm getting on, I'm, I'm, I'm going where I want to go, I'm not even going to think about these other people, and I'm getting off on the right floor. Right? That's, that's what you're thinking. i got to get off here. But you know what? There are different rules depending on who you're riding this elevator with. So if I'm riding alone, I am particularly mindful when another person gets on, especially if it's a man. You know, if I'm riding by myself, I might be singing. I might be singing. <clears throat> you know, and I'll stop if somebody else gets on because it's a, it's a personal space. We are all sharing personal space. And, and you don't want to do or say anything that freaks that other person out, am I right? I mean, you don't want that other person to get off the elevator and say, man, they're a real weirdo in there. <laughs> Maybe a pretty good singer, but a real weirdo. No. All right, but let me change this. Think, now imagine you're riding an elevator with a friend. And you might have a little 
little light conversation about where you're going or what you're going to do. Um, if, if you're with, if you're on the elevator and a whole crowd of people gets on, then think about this. They act like they own the elevator, and they'll they'll crowd on and they'll be laughing and they'll be jostling, and and you just kind of cringe in the corner. Am I right? The crowd forgot the rules, or they or they just didn't care. But have you ever been on an elevator with your sweetheart, with your husband or your wife, and the doors close? It's an intimate space. It's an intimate moment. You might steal a kiss. Elevator rules. And then you bring apart when the doors open. Okay. You got all those ideas in your mind of riding the elevator? Here's the deal. Imagine that you are on an elevator with God. Just kind of measure, just kind of, let's take the temperament of, 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 of your love relationship with God. So imagine you're on this elevator with God, and what is that like? Are you face forward with uncomfortable silence? You don't know what to say? Or maybe you have a friendly conversation. Or maybe it's an intimate moment. Maybe you've known each other so long, there's this sense of, of passionate joy, and you think, I'm so glad to have this time to be alone with you, God. I don't know where, how you measure your, the temperature of your relationship with God, but maybe those images help you a little bit. And we have got to keep up the, the practices that make for good relationships. We've got to spend time with one another. We have to communicate to keep our relationship strong. You know, most of the people that come to my office and want to talk about their marriage, they have waited until it's almost too late. So if you are in a relationship that seems distant or strained, and it might be a marriage, it, it, it might be um, a relationship with a teenager or an adult child, or, or maybe with your best friend, then something has happened. Go to them. Go to them and say, I love you and I want this to be better. Go to them and say, I'm sorry. Say to them, you win. I give up. I, I, I want our future to be better together. See, you initiate the conversation. Take the steps to make things better. Because you know, if you don't, it's probably not going to happen. Well, staying in love with God like our relationships with other people. Um, we can't measure by highs and lows, mountaintops or valleys, because life has ups and downs. So you can't depend on the things around you. You can't depend on feelings or those circumstances to make you feel like you're in love with God. You can't come to church and blame the sermon for not making you feel like you're in love with God. Now stick with me here, folks. If you you're in love with God and you walk through the door and you get a below average sermon, I'm sorry friends, but it won't matter because you're so excited. You're so in love with God, you're excited from the moment that you wake up and you're just praising God. And you say, God, you are awesome. Thank you for this day. Thank you for the breath of life. Thank you for the miracles and the blessings all around. See, friends, when you do that, you, you make the preacher better just by your attitude. You might come to church and the choir forgets the words, or the organist hits the wrong note, or the preacher doesn't speak to you. It won't matter. Because if you're in love with God, there's going to be something in that music that touches you. There's going to be something some, some kind of connection with other people. Something happens. Now, if you don't remember anything else from today, I want you to remember this, that staying in love with God begins with you and the choices that you make and what you want your life to be like. You might even write that down. I'll say it again. Staying in love with God begins with you and the choices you make and what you want your life to be to be like? Is it one of praise and love? 
You might say, yes, I didn't hear an amen on that, but I'm going to just go on and pretend that we did. Sometimes we do an amen. What do you want your life to be like? Let me, let me help you here. Because there are some ways, there are spiritual disciplines, spiritual practices that can help us to stay in love with God. So, first of all, pray. Now, I'm not talking about how other people pray. You start with where you are. And maybe you just say little prayers, maybe three times a week. Just because you can't pray like a saint doesn't mean that you're wrong. Just keep praying your prayers. Start where you are and keep at it. Because a relationship takes time to grow. And by practicing, by spending that time together over the months and the years, that relationship will become stronger. Second thing to think about is to be obedient, to be in submission. Now this, this is not a very popular word, so stick with me on this. This is actually a kind of prayer. To be obedient means to be developing the mind of Christ. It's not about me. It's not about God. It's, it is about God. Boy, did I miss food there. <laughs> Let me start over. I told you earlier, I think we're all imperfect people. So it's, it's developing the mind of Christ to becoming obedient. It's not about what we might think, but it's about what God says in our lives. We pray in the Lord's Prayer, not my will, but thine be done, O Lord. So you might develop your own quick little prayer that you could say, just today, Lord, I will go where you want me to go. I will love every person you want me to. That being obedient is a practice, is a key Christian characteristic. Number three, spend time in the scriptures. Read the Bible. And now... <clears throat> This might be a giant load of guilt if someone has ever said to you to start at the beginning and work your way through um, and read it straight through. I'm not saying that. Find the places that speak to you and then get with somebody to talk about them. Leave Leviticus for about five years. So here are some of my favorites. Genesis, very first book in the Bible. Uh, Psalms, and you can find Psalms by pretty much just putting your Bible closed and opening it in the center, and you'll have Psalms. There's 150 of them. Uh, Proverbs, it comes right after Psalms. Ecclesiastes, you'll find words of wisdom there. In the, in the New Testament, the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And then the New Testament letters, and I gave you some references today, like from 1 Corinthians or from Colossians, those are letters. See, the Bible leads us in a relationship with God, and it's not a burden. I don't care if you just read the Gospel of John every day for the rest of this year. You're going to be so blessed by that. So when you're reading the Bible, the next thing, practice that you can try is devotional reading. And there are a lot of authors out there that can help us with this. Um, Max Licato, Rob Bell, Anne Lamont, Madeline Lingle, Henry Now, and C.S. Lewis. Those are some of my favorites, and I'll be glad to talk more about them if you have questions. Uh, Dave Ramsey, the financial guy, he takes scriptural principles and applies them to daily life. So it's not just about having religious thoughts. It's how you get them into your daily life. Number five is to spend time with people. Now, you didn't know that was going to help bring you closer to God, didn't you? Spend time with people, people who love you, people who encourage you, family and friends. And also spend time with the people on the margins, people that need uh, some, some food, people that need, uh, in biblical terms, they need a cup of cold water. That's, that's an encouragement. John Wesley claimed that just spending time with the poor will transform our hearts. Think about it. If you've ever gone on a mission trip and you, you are radically transformed, our hearts get filled with passion for people that we're able to help in the name of Jesus. 
Teresa of Avila wrote, We can't always tell for sure if we're in love with God, but we're real sure if we're loving our neighbor. And first letter of John chapter 4 says, If we don't love our brother or sister, people that we have seen, how can we love God whom we've not seen? When we love God, we love the people around us, the, the, the people that God sends to us. And if we stop being loving and compassionate, it, it's a sure sign that our hearts have gone cold. So acts of kindness are tangible signs of love. So almost every week I'm asking the kids, how do you show love? How do you encourage somebody? What do you do? Because those things are real to the kids. They see them and they experience them. You know, when I ask new people, how did you find this church? I usually get one of two answers. Um, the first one, the one I get most of all, is that someone invited me. Someone asked me. The second one that I get is, I heard what you were doing in the community. It's making a difference in the world. And I wanted to be part of a group of people who, who believe in what God is doing. I want to be part of something that is bigger than me. So if you've recently come to this church, those answers might be pretty prominent for you. If it's been a while, you might be have to cast your mind back and think, why did you come here? Somehow, you were invited and you became part. And then the, the last uh, practice that I want to talk about today is spending time in silence. And we stay in love with God by spending time in silence. And this is kind of different than prayer. I want to talk about those times when you just let God speak to you. You go to your quiet place, your, your special place, wherever that might be, and don't, you don't even have to have anything on your mind. You just let God speak to you. You know, the Creator often speaks to us through creation. And somehow through the things that are made, God speaks to our souls. So you view a sunset and, and <clears throat> you think, wow, that's amazing. It, view a meteor. I get so excited about that meteor. Um, that doesn't happen very often. But a sunset, you know, happens every day of our lives. Um, you witness a birth. You think, wow, that's amazing. God speaks to us through so many different ways of creation. God reveals God's self to us. In uh, Romans chapter 1 verse 20 says, Ever since the creation of the world, God's eternal power and divine nature, invisible though they were, have been understood and seen through the things God has made. So friends, you don't have to wait until you go to the Grand Canyon. You don't have to wait until the next time you go to the beach. You don't have to wait until the next meteor strikes. Um, do you have a tree in your backyard? We've got some beautiful ones here. Um, Look out your window and see a bird light on a branch. And you can sit and watch and listen and hear the glory of God. So you can go to the park. We've got a, a, a special um, chapel, an outdoor chapel you might try. And there's a cross and it's surrounded by trees and flowers and there's some benches there. Um, it's just, uh, I guess, north of the parking lot. I'm not good with my directions. Anyway, it's out that way. <laughs> and there's a sign that points you there. So you can go there. Or go out into the field. Find those places where God speaks to you through creation. That's how we stay in love with God. And it's what God wants. It seems like we, we can't, if we can't hear God, it's because we have other priorities. We, we get busy. We've got TVs and cell phones and computers and video games and all that electronic noise destroys our quiet time and, and drowns God out. When Jesus was in Jerusalem before the crucifixion, he looks out over the city 
Can you just answer this? And he says, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you kill the prophets. He knew what was going to happen. You stone the people we send to you. And then he gives us this wonderful image. Jesus says, I long to gather you in my arms as a hen gathers her chicks. But you are not willing. God is so willing to draw us to God. You know if you're in love with God, you know, and only you know. It's, it's not a sissy thing. It's not something that modern people should shy away from. This is about meaning and purpose and hope. It's about lives that truly matter in frightening times. And so this is the hope and the opportunity of every Christian person, not simply to know about God, but to stay in love with God. If you're here today and you know that you're in love with God, that is awesome. But if you're thinking, I'm not quite where I should be, go and find that quiet place. Get on that elevator in your sacred imagination and then strike up that conversation because God is ready and God is willing and you will be so glad that you did. Let us pray. Thank you, God. You love us. You change us. You draw us away from our idols and you restore our human relationships. God, send a special blessing on those who go home today and, and talk about their relationships. Heal those broken places within us. Draw us closer to you. Let today be a day of change in those homes and in every individual here that calls upon you. We pray to stay in love with you and with the people you send us. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Let's continue in that same spirit of prayer as we pray the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. So friends, uh, Jesus gave us uh, one other tangible way to stay in love, and that's to share in the Lord's Supper. And I always like to say that uh, this is something that we do here every Sunday. You don't have to be a member of this church. You don't even have to be United Methodist. We have an open table. We believe God invites us all to that. Um, so in just a moment, we're going to sing as our, our elements, our gifts of bread and cup are brought in, and then we'll share in the Lord's Supper.
broke the bread and gave it to his friends and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, he took the cup and he gave thanks to you. He gave it to his friends and he said, Drink from this, all of you. For this is the, my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And therefore, in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we ask you to accept our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving, to we offer in union with Christ's sacrifice for us as a living and holy surrender of ourselves. Send the power of your Holy Spirit on us and on these gifts, and in the breaking of the bread and the sharing of the cup, we may know the presence of the living Christ, be one body in Him, cleansed by His blood, faithfully serve Him in the world, and look forward to His coming and final victory. Through Him, with Him, in Him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty God, now and forever. Amen. Friends, as you come forward today, you have choices. You can receive a bit of the bread and dip it in the cup. That's called intinction. All the bread we serve is gluten-free. Or you can uh, receive the bread and a uh, small cup of juice. You may kneel in prayer at the rail, or simply return to your seat in that same spirit of prayer. So, you have uh, choices. You come down the center aisle, you bring your offering and your attendance and put them in the basket. Table spread. Will you go?
Friends, I hope that, that you have taken these, these rules to heart. The do no harm. We're still practicing that. The do good. And now stay in love with God. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Amen.